Hey there, Knicks fans. How you doing? It's your boy, John of the Macri, with you uh, in quite a good mood for another episode of the Knicks Film School podcast. Uh, I think I'm allowed to be in a good mood. You beat the Nets. That's that's a reason to smile. Uh, and also because I get to talk to, to someone who um, I, I, might, I have a question for him before we talk about the Knicks. And I, I hope it means we, I'm going to get to keep talking to him because Doc Rivers was recently removed from um, Bill Simmons' podcast because he got hired to be the Bucks head coach. So before we get into any of this, Fred Katz of The Athletic, have you been contacted by John Horst uh, to join Doc Rivers' uh, coaching staff uh, in Milwaukee? And do I need to start planning for your replacement? No, no, I think I think we're we're solid. You might have to worry about me going to the ringer, though. But you know, who oh, shit. about that? He needs, needs a replacement a for realistic. Doc. Yeah, he needs a replacement for Doc, as does ABC slash ESPN, which I assume they're just going to move everybody up a slot. There, there was a report before. I didn't see where the report came from, but that uh, they're thinking about just going. I was going to say two man booth, two person booth uh, with Mike Breen and, and Doris, which I'd I'd be in favor of that. Not, I mean, unless they bring back Van Gundy, yeah. Well, they can't. He's with the Celtics. That's so, right. He's with the Celtics. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. two two person booth with Mike and Doris would be great. Mike is amazing. Doris is amazing. Doris is like, I don't know who my favorite in game analyst is. I don't know if I've won, but she's like in my tier one. Like, I don't think there's tier anybody one. better. I don't think there's anybody better than her. She's she's definitely she's probably the most prepared in-game analyst like she does her homework to an insane degree it's crazy like she'll hit up the beat writers before and be like what's your perspective on this why do you think this is happening why do you think this is happening and like no one else even does that sort of level really? of, of, of diligence yeah she's she's crazy prepared and then and then you'll be like doris i'll be like doris why are you asking me this when you know the answer she'll be like i want to know so I, i'll answer something and then she'll and then she'll say something that's like a follow-up question that's nine million times more intelligent than my observation and i'll be like doris you don't need me here. You don't need me. You're literally the best. What are we doing? Maybe uh, I, if you get, if you go to the ringer, maybe I could get Doris to f- start filling in for you since she's so knowledgeable and intelligent and, and clued in on the whole thing. She's the best. She's like truly one of my role models. She's amazing. Hall of Famer. They don't, they don't give those uh, designations out lightly. Um, okay. Well, listen, we usually, uh, bullshit for a while there's a lot to talk about so i kind of want to jump right in especially since you fred Katz, of the athletic and of uh, cats and shoot uh how did i forget that my god i'm not doing my job here i don't know you never forget it when i listen to the post game it's just referenced all the time <laughs> well it's because i listen to an avid listener um although i still need to catch the fisher episode which i i think will still be relevant i'm going to try to get it get to it today while i'm at the gym um it will be it will be i had jake on and we talked for those who don't know we talked we talked a lot of intel stuff and trade stuff and it really wasn't game dependent there's nothing that happened in that nets game that that makes that episode irrelevant good well hopefully i won't touch on too much of what you guys talked about already um but i i was i was about to say you, other than the actual trade that got the all of trade season uh, going, you got the ball rolling on this latest iteration of trade uh, talk slash speculation with your piece from, what was it, two weeks ago now? I don't even know when I lost track of, all time, track of time. Basically saying the Knicks are looking for um, and, you know, another playmaker. They're dangling Grimes. Um, I think your your words were like actively taking calls. How does one actively take calls, Fred Katz? I'm going to ask you the hard questions. Do you like sit with your hand hovering over the? Do they even have phones, or is it just all cell phones now? It's like, it's a good it's a good question. It's a very good question, and it's something that I think about when I'm writing it. <laughs> I didn't want to. Here's the thing: when you say they're taking calls on so and so, I didn't want it to be chalked up as like, well, of course they're taking calls on Quint Grimes. He's a bench player. Yeah. Well, it would be malpractice if if you called about Quentin Grimes and they were like, we're not taking calls on Quentin Grimes. And someone's like, here's LeBron for Quentin Grimes. And they're like, sorry, guess we missed out on it. We're not taking calls on Quentin Grimes. So I wanted to use, I mean, look, if you want to say to me, relying on adverbs is bad writing. Why is it I bad writing? Nothing. You don't want adverbs. Verbs. Writing is in the verbs, 
not the oh. adverbs. Writing is in the verbs. A good sentence is with the verbs. An adverb can make it too long, can be unnecessary, is often unnecessary. If you want to make that argument to me, that's fine. Uh, but I, I just wanted to be able to show that it was more than just a normal, they're taking calls on so-and-so. Uh, I also didn't want, you know, they're making calls, gives out the implication of like, they're calling every team in the league being like, Quentin Grimes is available. Quentin Grimes yeah. is available. I think it's more they were, they were letting the league know. They were perpetuating to the league. Okay, like this guy's available. You want him? Give us a call. Okay. Uh, as opposed to as opposed to somebody just randomly cold calling and then being like, okay, yeah, we'll take these calls. <laughs> like, and that's that's why I went actively taking no, calls. But you're right; it's 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 ridiculous. Like, if you said to me, like, ridiculous. what do you? If you said to me, if you said to me, what are you doing right now? And I was like, nothing. You're like, yeah, am I able to call you? And I'd be like, oh, I'm taking calls right now, but I'm not actively taking calls. You'd be like, what? What the? What the hell are you talking about? I I did not mean for this to go so off the rails. So that, but that I like, I like, by the way, how you started this segment with like, normally we just mess around and talk about useless crap at the start of the podcast <laughs> normally, but today we're just going to dive right in and we're going to talk about actively taking calls versus taking calls. I don't think this is useless. I think it's actually interesting. Okay. Anyway, you got the ball rolling with that piece, which you said they were actively taking calls. Um, and you also, I think, were the first person to put it out there that if the Knicks had their druthers, there's my word. You, Andrew likes perfect. You like uh, lovely. I like druthers. Um, if they had their druthers, they would like to get a contract that extends into next season because that uh, jives with their long term plans. Um, <clears throat> since then, there has been no shortage of reporting, not only from yourself, but a bunch of other people. Uh, trusted people who have tossed around this name and, and that name. And you now have kind of followed up your original piece with another report, which dropped today as we're recording this Wednesday, January 24th, in which you kind of outline why it is that it is going to be so difficult for them to find. I don't even want to say the perfect piece, because I think as you make clear in your article, the perfect piece does not exist. So I'm kind of just going to lob it to you. Do you want to like let the folks at home now know like where where are you coming at from this? And like, what do you know? Yeah. You know, I very rarely write column. My editor is telling me all the time to write like opinion columns. He's always I shouldn't say telling me all the time. He's not forcing me into it, but he encourages me all the time. Like if you feel strongly about something, you should write an opinion column on it. And it's just not really me i'm a reporter and that's really more my ethos and how i operate and i was working on this story and i was like you know what this is a column like i really believe this i have to write it and i hit up my editor i was like i'm writing a column for tomorrow and he was just so pumped he was like hell yeah that is exactly he was so i was like i'm gonna make jeff so happy so i mean as you said the story is basically about how there's not a perfect guy and I figured the best way to tell this story was like, there was no way to tell this story without injecting my opinion. And so I was like, you know what? I'm just going to say how I really feel, which is the Knicks are playing really good basketball right now. And the reason they're playing really good basketball right now is as much because of skill set as it is because of skill level. It's because it's because they, they brought in OG Ananobi, who is a monster for them defensively on the wing who is giving them spacing, who is giving them off-ball movement. We're seeing more ball movement. We're seeing more cutting. We're seeing the offense be more active. I know you pointed out on the post-game show last night that their offense technically in terms of ranking is actually a little down since they acquired Ananobi, but their points per possession are actually up. And I think the, the, the process has been really good, and I think we'll continue to look better. Now, the, the points per possession with the starters specifically has been phenomenal. Yes. It's when Brunson's off the floor that the offense drops and that passes the eye test. And if I were the Knicks, I just would not mess with that starting lineup. And part of the reason why is even if you bring in someone who is in a vacuum, a better player than Dante DiVincenzo, and the answer, the, the, the person that I use as an example for that is DeJounte Murray, who a lot of people are talking about, stylistically, when you talk about that skill set versus skill level, it doesn't quite work. Some, a line that I didn't write because I just thought comparing these two guys, it wasn't a good enough comparison. I didn't want to give the wrong impression and, and, and crap on my premise. But basically, what the Knicks were going through in the starting lineup at the beginning of the year 
was they had RJ, this slashing best with the ball, um, best inside the three point arc three alongside Quentin Grimes, a spot up, you know, defensive minded guy. Mm -hmm. And then they replaced Grimes with DiVincenzo, who is a different type of player who, who I should say is a different player than Grimes, but is in that mold. Defensive minded, he's better off the ball than than Grimes is. Grimes better on the ball, like you know they're, but they're the same mold. They're that defense doesn't need the ball to be successful sort of guy. And you had him next to this slasher and RJ, and you bring in OG, and now all of a sudden it's working not just because of OG's skill level. It's working because of how he plays, because of how he's spacing the floor, giving more room to Brunson, hitting corner threes, cutting, setting screens, all these sorts of things. If you just flip out your two for another slasher. You're basically recreating systematically the same thing that you had previously, which did not work as well. And I'm not, I didn't want to compare those two. I didn't want to say that, that RJ just becomes DeJounte and DiVincenzo becomes OG because it's not, it's not a one to one comparison on either side and it doesn't work. But what you're doing stylistically is you're reintroducing a slasher and you're adding someone who, I think there should be concerns about defensively considering the way that he's played on that side of the ball in Atlanta. It's, it's, it's just, I wouldn't mess with something that's going really, really, really well. That doesn't mean don't add help. That doesn't mean don't bring in someone who can create when Brunson's not on the floor or even maybe play next to Brunson in times. Doesn't mean any of that. I just would not mess with a starting lineup that is running other teams out of the gym especially when in the playoffs, those guys are going to play even more minutes together and they're probably going to be even more comfortable together because they'll have played more time together. I just, I would not mess around with that. I, to be clear, I don't have an indication that the Knicks are planning on doing that. I, I don't think they're like far along in DeJounte Murray talks. I wrote in that story that I don't believe that they've like entered negotiations for DeJounte Murray. It's been more discussing concepts and all that kind of stuff. Uh, which, which they do with a lot of teams. That's kind of their MO as a front office. They, they call teams and they, they throw out concepts and they're like, what would you do this? What do you think of this? What do you think of that? What do you think of this guy? And they just run through a million things. But I just would be very, very cautious about breaking up this starting five this year or messing with this starting five when I think it is, we have enough evidence to be able to say like, this thing works. Uh, speaking of the evidence, and I, I just pulled it up, not for this reason, but because I wanted to look at something else. Uh, current starting five, uh, as you alluded to, is outscoring teams by a little bit more than 19 points per 100 possessions. 128 offensive rating, 109 defensive rating. Those are obviously both elite numbers. The starting five with RJ in place of... Um, and we're, these are all with Hardenstein. Uh, RJ in place of Ananobi. Uh, 117 offensive, so 10 points worse per 100 uh, than... It is now and a this is almost like a fake number, 127.4 defense. Now that was over 10 games and was, you know, during a, a tough uh December stretch, I think. Like so context matters, but still like that's a that's a 30 what? Uh, yeah, it's a 30 point per hundred possession improvement. Like why you would and and the, the thing I was actually going to look up is for as great as it is that they're, what did I just say, averaging 128 points per 100 possessions, that's with a 14.6 turnover rate, which has been the one bugaboo. I, I, we don't have to spend a lot of time on it. I just, I think that could get better. I, I'm chalking some of this up to like, you're introducing a brand new piece who like does different things and like they, they need, I, I think that can improve. I don't know. Will it improve? I don't know, but I think it can improve. So I think this can even get any, a little better. I think the turnover rate is going to be higher than it was before. I think it will. And then, you know, then what? it was with, with our, like, okay, interesting. And, and you know what? I don't have a problem with it at all. What, what, what's what we talked about as the advantage to the way the Knicks played offensively last year when they climb up to second and or third tied for third in points yeah. per possession last season. And we're like, what are they doing? They're winning the possession game. But then mm -hmm. the criticism on them is, well, there's not enough movement. There's not enough player movement. There's not enough ball movement. And then what's the defense against that? It's, well, part of the reason you're winning the possession game is because there isn't a lot of player and ball movement. Yep. And when the ball sticks, you often have fewer turnovers and you can help win that possession game. 
And if you have guys who are really good in isolation, that's a strategy that some teams that are really good in isolation will take. Jalen Brunson is an insane one-on-one scorer. The James Harden Rockets would run a ton of isolation because James Harden was so amazing in isolation. Chris Paul was so amazing in isolation, and it really helped their turnovers. Usually, usually, not always, but usually, the more you pass the ball, the more the ball is ping-ponging around the court, the more turnovers you're going to have. Even the unbelievable championship winning, beautiful game, Golden State Warriors were like 29th, 30th in turnover rate every year because they were flinging the ball every which way and they would mess up a lot. Steph would mess up a lot and they turn the ball over a lot. And what we're seeing right now is a style with more player movement, more ball movement. And I actually do think it's going to be more conducive to success in, in the playoffs because they have more spacing. I think they are generally more difficult to guard in a seven game series. They are more difficult to adjust to, but with that is going to come some more turnovers. I think you just have to chalk that up. Do you want it to be up around 15%? That's kind of high. You want to get that down, but like last year they go through the season. They're, they're, you know, top part of the league in turnover rate, top part of the league in foul rate top part of the league in offensive rebound rate. And that's how they win the possession game. And they get these extra points to be able to be like, how is this team that can't shoot yeah. so good at offense? Like, how is this team scoring without ever making shots? And, and, and that's the answer. They're winning the possession game in that way. They're still a good rebounding team. They're still oh, yeah. good on the offensive boards. And I still think they can get down to a better number in terms of turnover rate. But when you, swing the ball over to RJ and you go into a little dribble handoff with RJ on, on the right side and he just goes downhill and it ends in him throwing up, you know, stopping and shooting a little turnaround eight footer. You're probably not going to turn the ball over ever on that play, but you're also going to score like 0.6 points per possession. Yeah. So I'll take the extra turnover if it means eliminating those sorts of lost possessions a hundred times out of a hundred. And I think that sort of ramification of that, I agree. It's a little high. I think it could come down, but it's just, that's just, that's what you get when you get more ball movement, player movement. What happens basically every time. It's a incredibly worthy trade-off. And to be clear, it's a trade-off that I'm happy that they're at and I'm okay with more turnovers. I I just think like, again, to get it a little bit down from where it is now is is within reason. I mean, Um, like 22 turnovers the other night were really bad. It was ridiculous. Some of the Randall ones have been, have been really, really bad. You know, he, he throws the ball so freaking hard. And sometimes he just doesn't need to No, he like does not. he's, he's kind of like reverse. Like you've seen bull Durham, right? Yes. Why? He's kind of like the opposite of nuke Lelouch. <laughs> like we're just like, as he goes, he's just continuing. You remember like Tim Robbins character, like nuke yeah. Lelouch. He's just, he's just a hundred mile an hour fastballs every time. And he has no idea how to pitch. He doesn't know how to breathe through his eyelids. Like he's just like, He's he's just like chucking these fastballs so over and over. That's what and Julius needs to learn how to do is breathe through his eyelids. Well, he needs to learn how to breathe through his eyelids. Like I, I feel like he's always thrown high velocity passes, but now it's just literally every single pass is a million miles an hour. Yeah. And every once in a while, it's just like, sorry, Julius, like Precious isn't going to catch that from 30 feet away. Like, I don't care how on target it is. He's just not going to catch that. Like, that's it's just not going to be the right basketball play. And and, uh, you know, some of those they could do away with, uh, you know, some of the, some of the other stuff they could do away with, but look, what are we seeing? What the, what's the type of turnover that we're seeing way more now? We're seeing a turnover once or twice a game. We see somebody, sometimes it's Brunson, sometimes it's Hart. We see somebody pass the ball to a spot where there's nobody. Yeah. It happens once or twice a game. And it's because they're expecting someone to cut and they don't. Or they're expecting someone not to cut and they do whatever else. To me, those are the turnovers where it's like, those are well-intentioned turnovers. Those are turnovers where it's like, okay, I'm expecting to lead you into this cut. I am expecting you to be open on this spot up three. And the guy was like, you know what? I'm going to open myself on a cut. The more they play together, the more they'll figure out that kind of stuff. The more OG will realize, okay, when Jalen's here, he likes me to cut here. And you just figure that stuff out by playing together. I think over time, you get a lot better at it. And uh, to use the Warriors as the example, again, that's the perfect scenario where they could play blindfolded, Clay and Steph and, and Draymond. Like they, 
they know where they are at every given time. And they know when I'm here, you're going to move here. And they could do that a million times out of a million. And they still mess it up and turn it over, even when they were at their height and winning a title two years ago. So like, I think it'll get better. I'm really not that concerned about the turnovers. I think they're going to come down. I really do. And I don't really care if they're higher than they were before. For all of those reasons, um, and the implicit, I don't know if you actually wrote it in the story, I forget, or in the column, excuse me, the column, um, but it was certainly implied, like, DeJounte Murray would not be coming here to come off the bench. Like, there's no universe where that player is going to come here and, and not start. Is that fair to say? I mean, let's put it this way. It's fair enough to say that I have not even asked anybody that question. There you go. Okay. Like, like, I haven't even... If it if it's true, then it would be like I I can't even say like yeah I've spoken to people and they say no way because I haven't even bothered I haven't even thought of course he would it's silly it, it's a silly premise he, like he's a starter in the league he's he's gonna want to start he's a he's twenty he's twenty nine he's twenty seven twenty seven yeah twenty seven he's twenty seven he was just an all star two years ago he's averaging twenty five and five he's shooting better than ever from three yeah, it's like, and it's, and part of part of the reason that he's gonna be traded is because he can't figure out a way to make it work perfectly yeah. with Trey Young. So like you're not just gonna bring him off the bay. Like you're also paying him like like they didn't if 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 you're willing to pay DeJounte Murray 28 million to come off the bench, you should have been willing to pay quickly less than that to come off the bench. You know, like it just they that wouldn't make any sense what so also like why would you give up what it takes to get DeJounte Murray to bring someone off the bench? So so for all of these reasons and probably more that we're forgetting, I I don't I, I people keep bringing up Murray to me as a name to target. And I, I just don't I didn't get it to some extent when the first when the story first came out, but it's like, all right, fine, due diligence, whatever the Hawks are tanking. I wouldn't blame I wouldn't blame anybody for as you say, picking up the phone and see if the other person on the other line is actively taking that call. Because like whatever, you never you never know what you're gonna find out. Um, I'm I'm kind of I haven't even considered this as a real possibility for some time now. The two names that interest me, or are interesting, <laughs> choose my words carefully here, because they've I feel like they've kind of emerged f- to to the top. Um, among some others we could talk about are Bruce Brown and Alec Burks, and I think it's interesting in the way you phrase it in the story or in the column. I'm going to keep making that mistake. It's you could say right. story. It is a story. I think a column is a story, but a story is not always a, a column. Is, it has a stated opinion in it. Okay. A story doesn't, but a story can. But so a story can story. have an opinion, but th- this is the column. It's a column. So it, you can say article. It, in the column, you have a great line about, you know what the Knicks are not going to do? They're not going to get someone that Tom Thibodeau was going to decide in five minutes. I'm fucking done with this guy. And if you don't think that Tom Thibodeau has it in him to decide in five minutes, I'm fucking done with this guy, then you don't know Tom Thibodeau. So, not that I know Tom Thibodeau. You know Tom Thibodeau. Do you think Tom, you would not put that past Tom, would you? I don't know. I like, you know what? Let me just, let me just call Cam Reddish really quick. There you go. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> let me call him really quick. Let's I'm sure he has says. glowing things to say about Tom and his whole, whole experience here uh, hey, with the Knicks. You know what I'll say to Cam? One thing about Cam Reddish is dude never said anything bad about anyone. That's true. Over the whole process. Never said anything bad about anyone. Just took it and kept his mouth shut and just kept showing up. And yeah. that's never so. So I don't think he would. But you know. I might, I might, I might inject him with some true serum and then give him a call. And, and he's, and then we'll see if he's, I, although I don't know if Cam is actively taking calls right now or if he's just, just taking well, them. He's back playing games. So maybe he's taking less calls. Um, Cam's not the only player. I'm sure that if you injected with true serum would, would have some uh, choice words about, about Tibbs. So, you, you know, he wrote this and I'm thinking to myself, well, so what are the reasons that Tibbs sours on guys? And like we could come up with a laundry list of things, but at the end of the day, if he does not trust you defensively, if he doesn't trust you on the boards and implicit in, in kind of 
one or both of those statements is if he doesn't trust you to play alongside Jalen Brunson. And that was the other crux of your column today, which is, and you've, and you've been uh, consistent about this since the summertime, any move the Knicks make from now until Jalen Brunson is no longer on the team, which hopefully is many, many years in the future has to be done with Jalen Brunson in mind. And you made another great point about the fact that like, it's like Jalen Brunson is, as we all know, a small guard. So like, how do you mitigate that? You mitigate that with probably more size then less size. And then I keep coming back to why Brown and Alec Burks have so, uh, kind of emerged as two names that it seems like they may be, may, may be nearing the top of their list. Because what do you know about both of them? For one, we know that they're big enough to play alongside Jalen Brunson. Um, and two, I think to our conversation before, the you know, kind of how the Knicks are playing you could easily see yourself plugging either of those guys into various Nick lineups and it working with the most important caveat that I want to get into in a second, which is Brown shooting. And and we'll get back to that in a second, but like as a general premise, do you agree with where I'm kind of seeing this thing as of now? Yeah, I think I do. I I think everyone is flawed. I think I'll add one thing to it, which is, we on the outside are doing guesswork. This guy seems like a Tibbs player. This guy doesn't seem like a Tibbs player. We know that Alec Burks is a Tibbs player yes, because he's played for Tibbs and Tibbs loves Alec Burks. Yeah. We know that we know that Tibbs would love Bruce Brown. The people on the inside, Leon Rose and World Wide West and Gerson Rosas, like they don't they don't need to guess. Yeah. Tibbs is actively taking calls from them. They could just be like, hey, Tom, how do you think this guy fits into the team? <laughs> and I know I know some people are critical of that. And they're like, you're just letting Tibbs build the roster in that case. And that's not his job. His job is to coach the roster the best way that it's supposed to be coached. But I'll tell you this much. There is a middle ground between yeah. the coach building the roster completely and the front office working in tandem with the coach to give him the best roster that he believes he can he can handle. I also think that there is just a reality to having Tibbs as your coach where you want he wants certain guys who play a certain way. And if you're going to choose him as your coach, then that's just a reality that you have making him your coach. And by the way, the guys that he wants, it's not like he prefers guys who can't shoot, you know? It's like the guys he Obviously. wants are guys who play their ass off and defend and rebound and are tough and it's like they're, they're objectively winning players, the guys who he wants. Now, because of that, y- you can end up with skill sets that don't match and lineups that don't work and, well, that's what and, we're and, and, and lineup decisions that end up being you know off from what you think might end up happening. And there's all of that for sure. But that's why you have the conversation. I have spoken to GMs who people consider phenomenal GMs, unbelievable GMs. And I've spoken to them about this dynamic where it's like, they're going to make, they want, I, I have spoken to, to GMs about like where they've like been like, we're going to make a trade for this guy. And then they call up the head coach and they're like, what do you, th-? And, and they were, they were ready to do it. They loved him. They hit up the head coach and they're like, what do you think? And the head coach was like, quite honestly, I think he sucks. I don't really know how to use him." And then the team was like, okay, well, I guess we're out then. Not because the head coach was like protesting, but because mm-hmm. they were like, the fit isn't good. If they, he's not a good fit with the head coach, if the head coach can't see the vision, then how's he going to implement the vision? And I think there needs to be that sort of conversation between a front office and a head coach that's just ongoing all the time. Uh, I don't think they're going to get a perfect player who can shoot and can facilitate and has a contract going into next year and it's a reasonable contract and can defend and can rebound and is tough. I, I just, you just look through the list. It's like, who's the guy? And by the way, isn't going to disrupt the starting lineup. You know, That's- like I, I, I don't know who who that guy is. There are a couple guys where I'm like, they come really close, but the contract isn't quite there. You know, it's like okay, like you want to go trade a couple second round picks and four years expiring for Tyus Jones. It's like, yeah, I see the vision. Tyus Jones is a good player, but but he's an expiring contract, so that. 
kind of complicates things. You want to, you want to go get Bruce Brown. It's like, he's got everything except he's not going to space the floor. Yeah. So it's like, there's, there's just something. It's like, everyone's a mighty ducks character. You know how everyone in the mighty ducks is like a perfect a player. Ex- everyone in the mighty ducks is a perfect player. <laughs> yes, I've seen the mighty one, ducks. But they have one flaw. That's just like comedically horrific. It's well, just like, what was Joshua like Jackson's Portman, flaw again? Uh, he wasn't quite good enough. He was an unbelievable leader. He was, that's why he was perfect because he wasn't quite good enough, but he was an unbelievable leader and he held the team together. But like, oh, that's cool. you that's just cool. like, got like the guy who is an unbelievable, has an unbelievable slap shot, but he can't control it. And then you got yeah. the guy who's an unbelievably fast skater, but he doesn't know how to stop. And it's like these ridiculous flaws that negate the unbelievable talent. Uh, and then, and, 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 and it's there's an element of that in all of these trade candidates, the Knicks go after. And so if you look for the perfect guy, you're just you're gonna end up not with anybody, I don't think. Unless, of course, they pull somebody like if they pull a rabbit out of their hat, they make an unbelievable trade, which I guess I, is is on the table. But of the usual names that we're looking at with fair trades that we can make up in our living rooms and whatnot, like I don't think there's like a perfect guy, there's gonna be a flaw. So you can't ask who's the perfect fit. You just have to ask. Who's the best one? Do you have an opinion on which one, like which thing they are least willing to compromise on? If the answer is no, that's fine. You, you, I don't know if you, if you don't have an opinion, you don't have an opinion. I, I think they feel really strongly. I mean, I think they feel really strongly about the contract stuff. If it means parting with something good. Okay. Can I know? Like, I I don't think I would be surprised if they traded Evan Fournier for an expiring. Okay. And I would be surprised if they traded a first for an expiring. And yeah, I would be, I would be surprised in that. However, if they're able to get Alec Burks and all it takes is like a second round pick, that's a different conversation because now they're still retaining Fournier's team option to be able to trade this summer. You're still still keeping those two first round picks that you have in the upcoming draft. Like that's a different conversation. But like if you're giving up something for for an expiring guy, like I don't see them trading Fournier and the Wizards first and the Utah second for Tyus Jones. Like I just I don't see it. I've heard nothing about that kind of stuff, even though I actually think Tyus Jones would make a ton of basketball sense for them. Uh I I I I think the contract stuff is really important for them because again, like this is the grand plan. They want to trade for a star and they recognize that if they have an extra salary of about $20 million this summer and for the 24, 25 season, then that means not having to trade Josh Hart or Dante DiVincenzo or somebody else who they might not want to include in the deal for a star just to be able to make the money work. So, okay. I want to go back to something because there's a couple of things you just brought. Actually, so, John, can I can yes. I interrupt you? Even though I just talked for 48 consecutive minutes, can I? It's your show, man. I have one caveat. What? I have a caveat to my caveat, which it's is funny because I wonder if it's something that I'm about. I was about to ask you, but keep going. If they were to trade for someone on an expiring, yeah, I think it would be because they were like, like it wouldn't be a rental. Like I think it would be like so, we okay. plan on re-signing this guy, and now this guy is the replacement for when we include either like Hart or DiVincenzo in a star trade this summer. So that is been, and it, and we all, all roads lead back to CAA. If they have, if they feel confident that whoever would ever expiring that they are going to acquire, will play ball with them this summer. And whether that means extending on a number that they already have a good idea they could live with, or perhaps more importantly, um, and again, I, well, I'll ask you, is this even done what I'm about to propose? Someone who would kind of, there would be an implicit understanding like, look, we may need you to agree to some sort of sign and trade this summer. It's going to be at this number and you know pretty much what the number is going to be because to avoid the base year compensation rules, you have to have it uh, no more than a, a 20% raise. But like, let's say, okay, you're going to get a 20% raise. You know, you're going to go somewhere. Maybe only the first year of that contract is fully guaranteed. But something along those lines where, and that's the thing I keep coming back to with Burks. Like, of all, like you would think, I actually don't even know. Is he, is, is he CAA? I don't even think Burks is CAA. No, he's not. He's not. Okay. So, but maybe there's a relationship, whatever there. 
I, is that something that you think will will factor in into whether or not they will go for someone? I mean, here's the caveat that I'll say. Um, that of course would be super illegal, <laughs> and that's that's what like you know we've been. That's what all the talk of the Sixers and Harden has been for so long, right? Like that the Sixers sure. may have offered Harden a contract before they were allowed to promise Harden a contract in the future if you picked up an option, whatever. Yeah. And that was the stuff the league looked into. If that were to happen, the league would come down so hard on the Knicks. I will also say it's a little tough to be able to do that because when you sign and trade somebody, another team has to be willing to take that guy on the sign and trade. Sure. And that's hard to figure out right now. I wasn't even really thinking that. I was more thinking like if they trade for, I'm just going to say player X so that I don't start a rumor. <laughs> if they trade for player X and player X is on an expiring contract and the trade is Fournier and a first for player X, maybe plus other stuff, who knows? I don't know what player X's salary is. So let's say player X is expiring. Okay. I think the only way they justify a trade like that is if they view player X as the guy who's part of their future instead of a Josh Hart or a DiVincenzo. And then Josh oh. Hart or DiVincenzo becomes part of that star trade. I got And you. then they re-sign that guy this summer. I think that's probably a less messy way to do something yeah, like that. that. But again, you look at the guys who we're hearing, like you mentioned CAA, Bruce Brown is with CAA. That's not a worry with Bruce Brown. Bruce Brown has a team option for next year, 23 million. If the Knicks were to trade Bruce Brown, I can tell you right now, like they'd be doing it to pick up the team option. Like that's sure. That's yeah. part of what they've been doing. They really value those expiring contracts in that range of salary. They'd be doing it to pick up the team option. Like that's the that's the kind of stuff that they're after. That's their preference. Again, I I would I would be surprised if it was for an expiring. And if it were for an expiring, though, it would it would be for someone who I think would be on the team in twenty four twenty five on a new contract. One more thing again, because no one wants to hear me talk anymore about Alec Burks. Um, logistically, how do you think that that would work? Because Burks is at ten point five. So, are you thinking Burks plus? For, for you just said you didn't think it would be for Fournier because then you're dealing with an expiring and he's kind of old. Yeah, enough. I know. Burks is tough with the salary, right? And I'd have to go it, through. It, I'd have to go through and do it. But Burks is tough with the salary, like unless he makes no. But I don't if, think Burks is necessarily in this category though. Because you're not trading a first to get Alec Burks. No, I, I know. I'm just wondering logistically, like to get to 10 million, you're you you. I mean, you have to use one of the two one of the salaries you just got, either Precious or Flynn. So let's just say let's just say Flynn. But you can't aggregate him. So that means you're sending Flynn into somebody's like trade exception or injury exception out there as part of the outgoing money. So you're gonna have to pay a tax to whoever's taking him on, and then you're gonna send, I guess. What's the I mean, what's the next lowest salary they have? Um, oh, or or John or what? Or there's just a third team. And but you still okay? Sure. I I still find logistically the Burks thing to be a bit of a mystery to me. Yeah, um, it's tough. It's tough with his with his salary. It's totally tough. Uh, but but or there's or there's a third team. And they take in Burks and somebody else comes from another team and they send out and they send out know, Fournier okay. and a first or something and and they get back two guys or something like that, you know? Okay. Maybe maybe Grimes goes out in that deal and they bring back bring back two guys. Like I don't I don't know exactly okay. how it would work. I don't know who that third team would be. It could be that that trade is part of a trade that isn't at all considered the Alec Burks trade. You know, it could be considered the DeJounte Murray trade, but DeJounte is not going to the Knicks. DeJounte is going to Detroit. And then, you know, Burks and the Knicks swoop in as a third team and DeJounte Murray, which is like something that that wouldn't shock me if the Knicks swooped in as a third team with another, with another couple of teams making, making a bigger trade where the biggest name is going between two teams that aren't the Knicks and the Knicks, tried to swoop in that way and, and get somebody that wouldn't shock me either. So I'll ask about it just because I just wrote about it, even though as I was writing about it, I'm like, this is not <laughs> going to happen. 
uh, D'Angelo Russell's name has been brought up uh, just as a potential I mean, CAA client. Uh, potential like him coming to the Knicks, Fournier going, I guess, in the scenario to the Hawks, and then uh, Murray going to the Lakers. I guess maybe Grimes would be involved, maybe not. I, you, you heard anything? Do you see anything on the D'Lo front for for the Knicks? Benji is going to kill me for this. Oh my goodness! Oh no! I mean, look, it depends on the price. It okay. depends on what you have to give up. But I don't hate it. Like, he's not a bad I hate it. player. Like, that's the thing. If you, I, the way I put it was like, if you're judging him by a guy who made the all star team at whatever he was, 23 years old, number two pick in the draft, you know, max, max ish contract, whatever, you know, should, should have been, was thought to be maybe a starter for a good Laker team and before that a starter for a good, or teams that hope to be good. He's a failure across the board if those are the metrics that you judge him on. If you just judge him as like a bench guard who could shoot and run a pick and roll. He's not a bad player. I just don't know if he violates rule number one, or maybe not rule number one, but one of the rules we were talking about a minute ago, which is like, how much is Tibbs going to trust this guy to be on the floor with Jalen Brunson? Because you're not acquiring D'Angelo Russell to be a 10 minute a game player in the, at least I don't think, in the playoffs, which is all a backup is going to play. And hell, maybe not even that much. So, like, it, I don't know. That's the tough part there. And that, by the way, that goes, you could say the same thing about Clarkson. You could say the same thing about uh, probably half a dozen other candidates that have been mentioned. You could say the same thing about most guards in the NBA. I mean, sure. that's why. Absolutely. Like, yes. That's why, that's why I hate the, is Jalen Brunson a 1A or 1B conversation? It's not just because it's like, honestly, just a little low brow. It's not just because of that. It's, it's also because it's, yeah, yeah, I said it. I'm a pretentious dick. <laughs> I'm a pretentious dick who's never made a mistake anywhere, including on social media in my entire life. And here's my issue with it. What is it's that? It's that it's getting at something that is true and taking the wrong route to it. And everyone's missing it. It's that. If I say you can't win with a small guard as your best player and you say yes you can now all of a sudden we're debating about a thing which we might actually agree on which is that having a small guard as your best player presents challenges to roster building that having a big wing as your best player does not and that's really where it is and one of the things is if your best player is a big wing and you're looking to go get a star you're not really hampered in the type of star you can bring in, or you're less hampered. If your best player is a big wing, you could be like, bring in Donovan Mitchell. He's awesome. He's going to be the second best player on this team. He can totally be the second best player on a championship caliber team. And I'm not just saying that. I, he absolutely could sure. be the second best player on a championship caliber team. And all of a sudden, you're rolling. But now, because you have Jalen Brunson, you're like, who are those guys going to get taken advantage of in the playoffs? Because now you got two small guards. It's just more difficult. If you have a big wing, you could be like, oh my gosh, yeah, of course, bring in a second bring awesome big wing. Are you kidding me? Now you have Paul George and Kawhi, or you have Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. Like, when has, it never, when has a team ever been unsuccessful because it had two awesome big wings instead of one awesome big wing? But when it has two awesome small guards, you can have issues and moments that really matter. And that's really where we're at with all of this. And that works on a smaller scale too, not just pairing Brunson with an awesome star, but also pairing him with someone like maybe a Russell or somebody else. And that's why I think it's kind of hard to be like, okay, they need a facilitator, but they also need somebody it's who is, is going to be able to play and who also isn't going to be worth too much on the trade market that it's awful if he's only playing eight minutes, which is why almost like someone like Bruce Brown might be a little better, even though he's not necessarily your conventional like backup point guard. He's not your give him the ball and let him run the offense kind of guy. But you know he can at least play next to Brunson, and it's not going to be a, a waste if he's playing 20 minutes after that trade. Or, or take it a different route. If you're getting someone that all they deserve to play is 12 minutes a game, then the player you're getting probably isn't going to change your life, right? It, it, you know, so, okay, 
then if you get the guy that is that is good enough to, and should be playing 24 minutes a game, then all of a sudden, DiVincenzo, 24 minutes, that player is going to play his other 12 minutes uh, at the shooting guard position. And all of a sudden now you have uh, 20 or hold on if I could do some quick math, 36 minutes a game in which your Jalen Brunson is going to be alongside a. Uh, a, a small guard or 25 my, my math just got mixed up a lot of time more time than Tom Thibodeau would like which gets us back to Brown I want to finish up here and then I know I said we're going to get to a bunch of other stuff but I'll ask you a quick thing on Harnstein before we go um, and by the way for anybody I wanted to plug your article so we're indirectly talking about your article on Jalen Brunson which you wrote earlier this week and why Jalen Brunson is so amazing and I would just say for anybody who hasn't read that check it out it's about shot angles that Jalen Brunson takes on many of his shots and it's like the latest piece of a thousand pieces of evidence that justify why the Knicks should be going through all this trouble. Because Jalen Brunson's fucking awesome. And he is a godsend to the organization. Hopefully he'll be starting the All-Star game. Bruce Brown. Um, <laughs> am I crazy for talking myself into the shooting not being as big a deal as everybody seems to think it is going to be? Because I feel like if you're saying, okay. In the playoffs, he's going to be my backup point guard for 12 minutes a game or 10, 12 minutes a game. Okay, so you could surround him with enough shooting to make that work in theory. So then it's like, all right, well, what about the minutes he's going to be at the two? And how many of those minutes are he, is he going to be with Josh Hart on the floor at the same time? Because that's really what we're talking about here, right? It's Brown and Hart on the floor at the same time. Is that going to be, is that going to be 10 minutes a game? And you're telling me that they couldn't get, I'm trying to sell you on this, that you couldn't get away with 10 minutes a game if you also have Jalen Brunson on the floor, who I feel like cures a lot of ills. Um, maybe that's naive of me, but that's kind of what I'm going off of. I want to know your opinion. No, it's not crazy. It's just, it's like I said, it's, it's, it's imperfect. Uh, yes. First of all, if your bench unit can't shoot, it's not as bad as if your starters can't shoot for every obvious reason. One of them being that they're probably going up against bench players who are, are usually more chaotic units and also not as good. And they're not necessarily going to be able to take advantage of other teams flaws quite as much. If you have somebody who can run the offense, I think that's, that's more, that's more important. And right now, I mean, look, McBride has actually been better than I thought he was going to be. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, he's, he's proven to be a rotation player. I was skeptical of that extension when they gave it to him. After seeing how he's played since getting it, I, I totally understand why they gave him that extension. He's it's totally fine. He's, he's, been, he's been a hound defensively. He's had some really hot offensive games, but he hasn't run an offense. You know, that's not, that's not, what he does stylistically is he dribbles a lot and he's not going to get you into your actions and that kind of stuff. And they could use somebody who's able to do that. If I were them, that would be, that would be my first priority over all else. Would it be great to get a shooter? Yeah. But it's like, again, I feel like I'm being redundant. You just have to run through the alternatives where it's like, okay, maybe you're able to go get Jordan Clarkson. Maybe, but, you're not going to get Jordan Clarkson for nothing. No. And the Jazz, I don't think the Jazz feel compelled. Everybody's like, oh, the Jazz are going to trade Clarkson. They could trade Sexton. They could they could trade Linux. I think Linux's the only one where the Jazz really feel compelled to trade because he's expiring. The other ones, it's like Clarkson's under contract for two more years after this one. If they don't get an offer they they like, and they're playing good ball. like they, And it's they, at a good they, number. That that was a great yeah. bit of business to the, use their cap space last year. And the Sexton contract all of a sudden. I mean, why would you trade Collins? I mean, unless someone's gonna blow you away. What like you if you're if you're Ainge, you need to get a like, I don't know what the blue chip thing would be, but you gotta get a real thing for for uh Sexton, especially the way he's been playing. He's been great. He's been Colin awesome. Sexton is Colin Sexton is overly criticized. I know he's not a, like a facilitator, I know he's not a defender. People talk about him like he's just like a chucker. And for two years, he has been a modicum of, of efficiency. Our mutual friend, Jared Dubin, just wrote in his Substack newsletter how uh, Clarkson's been really good, or excuse me, Sexton's been really good penetrating and dishing um, off of drives, which is a thing that he d does not have a reputation for. Yeah, he's been he's been really good. And, and he's young. I think it'd be really funny if they used him as like 
a piece to then trade back for Donovan Mitchell <laughs> after he was part of the original Donovan Mitchell trade. The Knicks, and, you and, mean get get sex? Yes. Yeah. There you and, go. and look, we can have a whole conversation about whether Donovan Mitchell should be the guy anyway, based on all this stuff not, that we're talking about with Brunson right now. Not today. I'm sure we'll. Yes, I'm sure we'll save that for another day. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I just I run through it, and I don't think there's anybody who is perfect. And and I just I'm really skeptical of the Dejounte Murray fit. He he has a reputation of being a defender, and then you watch him in Atlanta, and you're like, he's not defending though. Like like he's really not defending. And I just need to know. This is why you have advanced or not advanced scouting. This is why you have pro personnel scouting departments, because a lot of what pro personnel scouts are doing, you know, there didn't used to be pro personnel scouting departments in NBA teams. It's like what's a pretty what's the difference thing. between a pro personnel scout and just a, a scout? Because I, I frankly so, don't know. So you have you have amateur scouts, which are going to look at you know, okay. which are going to look at uh, you know, college kids and that kind of stuff for the draft. You're going to have advanced scouts, which are going to go to the the look at the teams that you're about to play you're and playing, gonna, okay. they work for the coaching staff. So your advanced scout is like the Knicks play Denver tomorrow. So the Knicks had an advanced scout or two at a Denver game, I don't know, a few days ago. And they watch Denver and they map out all their plays and they write out all their scouting reports. This guy's doing this well now. This guy has now changed how he's operating on this. They now run this play with this guy in the corner as opposed to this guy. You're doing all that kind of stuff. And then you're reporting that back to the coaching staff so they're able to put together a scouting report for the upcoming game. Those are advanced scouts. And then there are pro personnel scouts who scout pro personnel. And there didn't used to be pro personnel departments on NBA teams. It's like kind of the newest branch of NBA front offices. It's really taken off in the last 10 years or so. And the reason why was because the kind of line of thinking with lead execs was always, well, if you're in the league, I have an opinion of you. Like I don't need an opinion on Jordan Clarkson. I know I don't need an opinion on DeJounte Murray. I, I'm a GM of an NBA team. I obviously know everything there is to know about DeJounte Murray's game. But part of the value in having those pro personnel scouts now is not necessarily just getting like, hey, DeJounte Murray hasn't been as good on defense this year. Hey, he's falling asleep off the ball more. It's, it's more actually like the off-the-court stuff. It's the intel. And it's... Oh, this guy, you know, you're talking, oh, would this guy be amenable to this kind of contract? Let's do some digging, see if we can find out. Would this guy fit in with our personality? Let's let's check in with his college coaches. Let's do some recon. Let's see what's going on. It's almost like an investigative job in some ways. And interesting. And one thing, if I were any team that was interested in DeJounte Murray, one thing that I would have my pro personnel department doing right now is find out the answer to the question, why is he not defending this year? Because he was quite good. And I actually always thought it was a little overstated, his value, because he was a gambler. and But he was really good in passing lanes, and he was disruptive and, and definitely a good defender. And he has really fallen off a cliff. Now I want to know, is he not defending because something's different with his body? That would be important to know. Is he not defending because... He's not happy in Atlanta. Is he not defending because he doesn't understand the schemes or doesn't believe in the schemes, can't get behind them? If that's the case, maybe that changes with a change of scenery. Is he not defending because he started to become more of a scorer and was like, well, that's it for defense now. If that's the case, that's something I want to know. Is he not defending because he got the big contract extension? And he's like, well, I got paid. I don't have to defend. I, To be clear, I have no idea what the answer is. It could be something that I didn't list that I couldn't even think of. But I would need to know, in order to say, like, will he start to defend again, you need to know what the answer to that question is. And if I'm any team that's considering DeJounte Murray, like, I'm going after that. All this is to say, John, I don't don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I don't know. There's not a perfect answer, which is why, as long as they do something that is logical and part of a plan that makes sense and doesn't totally screw them in the short term and or long term and doesn't mess up the good stuff they already have. Sure. I'll probably understand whatever their move is. And I do think there will be a move and I do think there should be a move considering 
kind of the way they've struggled with Brunson off the court. Um, two last things. Well, three. We really, I get a shatter. Three last things in five minutes. We're gonna do. This. I can stay. I don't care. I got nowhere to be. You're so nice. Okay, I still want to make it quick because I have to get out of here. Um, on Brown, do you? Ag- <laughs> if you had to guess. Would you guess that if they acquire Brown and let's assume that Quentin Grimes goes out in the deal, whether it's to Toronto or somewhere else, that come playoff time, there will probably be an eight-man rotation? You mean with like Deuce out of it? Deuce out of it, yeah. Yeah, that probably sounds right. Okay. I mean, Tibbs is going with an eight-man rotation in second half. Second half, anyway. Yeah. yeah, like when Hartenstein's healthy, he's going. I mean, I, I could... If if Mitch isn't back, like he could go with an eight man in the first half, and he would go with a seven man when his back's against the wall. Um, right? I, I, no, absolutely. I, I mean, and it, I ask that again because, like, if you're looking at Brown and you're looking at what he's able to do in the playoffs, the odds are that he will be out there. Probably exclusively when Brunson is off the court, he will be out there with Hart and Anobi and Randall and whichever the center is. Like that's a, I, I think that'll just my two cents. I think that'll work, um, especially since like you brought up shooting before. Guess what the backup unit right now could do? They could shoot. Do surprise one of the best three point shooters in the league by percentage. He's pulling up. Quentin Grimes, obviously, you know, he could shoot. Um, and Hart, obviously, is the one who can't. But when Ananobi's in there, he's great corner three shooter. So like, it's like, I, I'd kind of just rather get the better basketball player in there. But that's just me. I know Andrew's not a fan of this. Um, second question, Brogdon. We haven't talked about Brogdon. I know a that lot unit of is also, like, that's a pretty monster defensive unit. That's what I was getting. Brown, Brown, Hart, and Anobi, and I don't care if you got Hartenstein there or Mitch there. If Mitch is back, like that's that's a monster defensive combination with those four guys. That you just you just, that's just active. It's stifling. I mean, if there is an argument, you could put together lineups where Josh Hart is your fourth best defender. Oh you yeah, know? you could like easily. Josh Hart's a good defender. Like you could put together, there are points of points over the last year where Josh Hart is the guy they have guarding the other team's best player. They could put together lineups if they want, where like, you know, if they, if in the regular season, even, I don't think they would do this in the postseason because postseason, I don't think you're going Randall and Brownson off the floor unless, you know what? I take that back. I said that and I, I don't actually believe it. I think there's a world where maybe you do. If Randall is getting so smothered by double teams when he doesn't have Brunson there and you're like, let's just optim- optimize him next to Brunson. And we're just going to go, if you, if you want to go that way and you're sure. like, let's just go all defense with a second unit, you could mess with things around. So you got Brown, you got Hart, you got Ananobi, you've got one of the centers and you've got like, you could throw another defender out there. You could work it so that DiVincenzo is out there with the bench and like, oh. That's a monster defensive unit. You're just not going to score. Can I please jump Andrew's in? Andrew's coming in. Can I no please jump score. in? How yes, are they scoring yeah, points in. on that unit? Please tell me how they're scoring points. Well, for on one, that. How scoring- are they scoring points on this unit? Right. They're so not. they don't need defensive issues. They don't have defensive issues right now on the second unit. They need an offensive I, upgrade. This is I, Tom Thibodeau we're talking about. He's made defensive units work in the past. And Bruce Brown may not be able to shoot the ball very well. He's a guy who could run a pick and roll. Fred Katz, you actually wrote in your story today, I believe. And when you know that you don't have to honor the shot, you can defend the pick and roll easier. I, How about this? Play Quentin Grimes. He can shoot. Their defensive unit right now in the second unit is great. That, that the four-minute stretch to start the fourth quarter last night was pretty good. Hey, hey, what did I, Andrew, what did I text the group chat yesterday? Yes. Just play Quentin Grimes, which is why enabling said, this Bruce Brown talk is irresponsible on your part, Fred Katz. I said... I said the Knicks, I sent to the group chat yesterday. I said the Knicks could really use a guy who can shoot threes, move off the ball, guard well on the ball, guard well enough off the ball. But they could really use a Quentin Grimes type. It's a shame that they don't have the ability. I completely agree. 
unfortunately, there are a finite number of minutes and there is a need right now for something that Quentin Grimes, for as much as he does pretty well, uh, does not do. And they need to solve that problem. And as we just spent an hour talking about, there are no perfect solutions to this problem, but it is a problem and it is a problem that needs to be addressed before the playoffs. I'm including and- Andrew. So Andrew, who's, I, I, I agree with all the Brown criticism. Like I, I agree, but okay. Who's, who's the guy? Alec Burks, Jordan Clarkson, a point guard. Like that's who. Okay. So I, I, love, that can- I love, I just want to clip you right now. What? Just take this, take this video, that sentence right there. Alec Burks, Jordan Clarkson, a point guard. I want to take that clip. I want to get a time machine. Uh-huh. I want to go back in time to the 2021-22 season. Yeah. I just want to show that clip of you uh-huh. saying Alec Burks, a point guard, yeah. to the version of you that spent a season watching Alec Burks, the point guard. Okay, that's I'm a strong man, because that's not the, that's not the it argument. Is. Like, saying that it has anything to do I'm with him this. getting starts over Emmanuel quickly in games that don't matter is not <laughs> the, that I'm talking about. Okay, Fred? <laughs> of course. What I'm saying right now is what they could use since the team has prioritized going for wins is a guy that got 33 points for the, and I, I quote our good friend, Benji Ritholtz, the solid four and 40 Detroit Pistons. It, and all he's it, doing is getting buckets on their second unit. Right? Andrew, going, going, going off in January. Yeah. Alec Burks. Going, I, I yes. love No one loves Alec Burks more than me. It's a contract oh, issue. It's a contract issue. That's what I, That's I, all I, it is. I understand the imperfect options that you're all talking about. The fact that this keeps going back to Bruce Brown and then it's like, oh, we could make this work and they could play defense. The second unit right now plays enough defense. They're not scoring. And he would the make, whole, and he would and he would make the offense. He would absolutely make the offense better to say nothing. Of the fact that I think their their opportunities in transition would increase. I think that unit defensively would generate a lot more transition opportunities than, than the unit they have out there now is. Andrew, here's I, my thing. Here's my thing. I agree with you. If you can just like find a way to get Alec Burks where the only thing of value you give up is a second round pick, I think that's a great ad. That's awesome. Then you throw in Alec Burks, you add him to what you already have, and you're in you're in good shape. And 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 hopefully you don't have to give up as much for Alec Burks as you do for Bruce Brown for every obvious reason. That being said, if you just throw Alec Burks into this second unit. It's not like all of a sudden they're scoring like crazy either. <laughs> like they're scoring more. Probably scoring easier. If we're just talking about the 12 minutes that, J- that Jalen Brunson's not going to play, probably less in the postseason. It's probably is a gonna, guy. Burks is going to create some buckets for himself. He's going to mm-hmm. shoot threes. He's really become a, a capable three point shooter, but it's not like he's he's running a play and getting a shot for somebody else. Like there, there are there are there are flaws everywhere around there. I agree with you. If it takes a lot for Bruce Brown, I would bow out. Like I, I think there could be a market for him there. He just keeps getting bit up even after like one thing where the Knicks are probably really happy about is that Terry Rozier only went for a lottery protected first and an expiring contract. And that was it. So now if anyone's like, well, yeah, you know, Jordan, Jordan Clarkson needs two firsts or Alex Caruso needs three firsts. You're like, what are you talking about? Terry Rozier was the one first and it was lottery protected. Even if it rolls into an unprotected the next year, like, what are you talking about? So I think that could help them, but I could see Brown just get bit up by the market because they're a, like a team like Philly could be like, no, he's, he's our, free, he's the fifth guy we need. He's, the, he's our, this is our free agency. Yeah. And then you just have to pay in order to get him. And if that's the case, I would not pay through the nose for Bruce Brown, but we're just talking about a bunch of guys who are realistic and are all going to bring in their own flaws. We're not talking about a bunch of guys, Fred. He is specifically, I feel like I'm in mean girls. He's trying to make, fe- make fetch work. He's trying to make. I was about to ask work. about another. First of all, I've, I've mentioned a lot of guys. I was about to ask about a, a different guy that we've. I should have asked about earlier. Malcolm Brogdon. Uh, Jake Fisher yeah. brought Malcolm Brogdon up to you. But before we move before on, Andrew, you, anything else? Before, just one follow-up question, to sure. Because there is one exactly one scenario where I probably get on board with the Bruce Brown train. Is there a world they can make a trade with Toronto that doesn't include Quentin Grimes? Yeah. Yeah. So if it's yeah. like Fournier and this year's like Fournier the, and the, this the year's Dallas first pick. Fournier, Fournier and like if it if it's like the Josh Hart trade from last year, and it's like Fournier and I, to be clear, and he just takes like Deuce's role in the rotation, and then Grimes. I'm worried about the spacing. I'm worried about the shooting specific. If you're actually trying to create a second unit, 
that is what I'm, I'm prioritizing. Yeah. I mean, to be clear, I would not trade a first and Quentin Grimes for Bruce Brown. Okay. Wanted that's to make a, that clear because that's, that's what an I overpay. believe the conversation has come to is that <laughs> we're trying to trade a young player that can do the things Bruce Brown can do on defense and shoot the he's, ball, which is something Bruce Brown can't. Don't do this, that he's not as good a defender as as, as Bruce Brown. He's he not is. as good a defender as Bruce he Brown. Is. Bruce he is. He was running the team's best uh, uh, point of attack options last year. It was doing it well. I think Bruce, Bruce Brown's a guy you could trust to defend in the playoffs. Quinn Grimes played 48 minutes a game five by your head coach. I know. He was <laughs> My good, goodness, he didn't nice play job. because he didn't shoot well, which, guess what? Bruce Brown doesn't do either. <laughs> Andrew, I, I absolutely <laughs> love this. You're the best I, producer I'm, I'm Ugatu. I feel <laughs> like I'm taking crazy pills over here. We have Josh Hart. We have the guy that does all the Timsy things. Sometimes more the merrier. I... I would not try give up and win every game 84 to 80, Fred. Stop, that's that's going to be the playoffs. Go ahead. I'll continue with the pot. I apologize. That's Maybe fine. they will. Oh. Uh, Brogdon is what, what a, I was going to say. A, what a but. cameo. Yeah, to be clear, by the way, I, Grimes and a first for Brown is no overpay. Like, you look, you look at the guys who have moved of similar ilk in the last few years. Like, I don't even know if, if, he, uh, Brown go. He could go for like a bad first, but I don't even know if he goes for a first. Toronto's not necessarily in a position of leverage unless they create one where he gets bid all the way up, like I was talking about before. And like, I, I could just see it being like a ton of seconds and and matching money for Bruce Brown. I, I could see it being something like that. Hachimura Maybe the went Knicks. for four seconds, right? And Hachimura was not had not proven himself to be a rotation player on a good team. Bruce Brown has proven himself to be a six man on a title team. Now it was a unique title team and his role was able to be what it was in part because they have a, a once in a billion years center who could do all the things where you could essentially play him at like kind of your Bruce Brown was their center in a lot of ways in terms of the spacing. So like very unique, but like he could still, he still proved that. Yeah, he's a good player. I, I, I wouldn't be shocked if it took, you know, last year when they traded Josh Hart, they sent their own, sent out their own pick. The lottery protected their, their own pick. And they said, if it's in the lottery this year, it just becomes two seconds and it gets expunged, but it probably won't be because they'll be in the playoffs. They could do a similar thing for Brown this year where they send a pick that will probably end up being in the twenties. It gets automatically expunged. There's a good chance that Dallas pick is going to be a better pick than their own pick. So if I were them, I'd be sending their own pick and not the Dallas pick. Right now, that Dallas pick is 17 and their pick is 22. Uh, and I would, you could do that, but I just I wouldn't do that plus Grimes. That I'm with Andrew. That right. that would be that would be a lot. I don't think I think Quentin Grimes should be worth more than that. Even even as he continues to to not play as much as he used to, maybe he should. And I agree, selling on him right now would I think be selling low. Uh, I am. Wait, you want to talk about Brogdon? Yeah, I just want to say quickly on Grimes. Oh, yeah. I, I the notion that this is going to 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 get better if he's on the team, meaning Grimes, and like not playing in the playoffs. Or like playing five minutes here and there in the playoffs, like that to me it is something doesn't sit right with that. And that's exactly if they get Bruce Brown without giving up Grimes, like you already know Grimes. There's some games he's not going to play, um, which again I'm sure that would go over swimmingly with all all parties involved. Uh, Brogdon, what are, what are your thoughts on on Brogdon? I mean, I I think he. It depends on what you you have to give up for him. Like I guess that's a caveat I should have given from the beginning. Or else Andrew would still have his head on straight. I think it exploded. I think it's all over the walls right now. Good. I can't even see him. I can't even see him. I think he might be gone. I think we might just be. He's expired. Yeah, we might just be on this podcast right now with no producer. We can say whatever we want. We can just go into Pistons talk. <laughs> all right. Let's uh, talk about Isaiah Stewart. <laughs> I can't believe, by the way, that we managed to talk about Alec Burks and not just go into Pistons talk. We did a good job with time. that. We did a good job with that. We did a great job. Um, I think Brogdon is somebody who would make sense. The one thing that comes up with Brogdon is the health. 
and yeah. the ability to potentially, you know, if you want to include him in a star trade next summer, he's already derailed one big time trade because he failed a physical. Yeah. And you might worry about that happening again, because if you're the Knicks, the last thing you want is to have Malcolm Brogdon in a star trade. And you finally have the guy that you've been hoping for, for four years since his front office took over and you got the trade and everything's agreed to. And Woj is tweeting it out and Shams has tweeted it out and I've written my story and everything's good to go. And then Brogdon fails the physical. And now either that superstar is headed somewhere else, which is what happened during that, that last trade, which is Brogdon fails the physical. He doesn't go to the Clippers and they have to work out a totally new trade, or you have to include somebody else that you didn't otherwise want to in order to make the money work. You know, maybe you have to include Josh Hart because he makes a similar amount of money. It just it just, or maybe it blows up and it doesn't happen at all. Like it's just an inconvenience that you don't want. But when we're talking about a bunch of imperfect, I kind of wish we had started with Brogdon because when we're talking okay. about a bunch of, of imperfect guys, Brogdon parentheses, if healthy, like that's kind of the one, you know, he's, he can play on the ball. He can play off the ball. He can come off the bench. He can spot start if you need it. If Brunson has to miss five games in March, Brogdon starting is is fine. He literally oh, he'd be a, a great man. start in uh, starting fill in. Totally, he literally just won six man of the year. He's having a pretty good year in Portland. The efficiency numbers are pretty good, even though he does not have offensive talent around him. Uh, he's been operating the way that you expect Malcolm Brogdon to operate. He's a vet. He knows how to play. I don't think Tibbs is going to sour on him, uh, and that's obviously something the front office could confirm before making a trade for him. Like to me, that would make that's a guy who just like basketball wise, it that makes sense to me. It if he was if he could stay on the floor defensively alongside Bronson, I think that's the that's the question. And you'd, you'd have to ask Tibbs that. I don't know, you know. If they if they got him, I have to imagine they had that conversation. And Tibbs said, Yeah, I think we could we could get away with it. Um but yeah, I would agree with that. I think that's the, I think it's that and the health thing. The health the health thing is was the when I first thought about Brian as an acquisition like over a month ago, I was like, are they really going to get someone that might not be an asset because of the health thing? That was the first thought, and then I kind of like talked myself out of that, and now you just reminded me of it. So I don't know. Um, all right, I think we covered all of the trade stuff. So I was going to spend like twenty minutes on this, but instead I'll spend two. Uh, DefCon one to DefCon five. Uh, five being the five is the most serious. There's one. One is the most serious. One it? is the most serious. I always get that wrong. Andrew, is your head exploded? We need confirmation on this. Defcon one is the the worst one. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, where do you think the Knicks are at with Hardenstein's uh, Achilles or sore foot, as Tom Thibodeau put it? Oh, I honestly don't know. I can't Defcon it. Okay. I can't, I can't, I can't DEFCON it. Injury stuff is really difficult to, to report on. And what I don't want to do is give a DEFCON level based on vibes that I've gotten when I personally haven't like seen the medicals, you know? Right. And, and then all of a sudden, like it's something really serious. And I said it wasn't, or it's not that serious. And I said it was, I will yeah. say, I think, uh, I'm very interested to see how, what Tibbs does with his minutes when he comes back. <laughs> if the front office tells him, dude, you cannot just literally play him for an entire second half. Like you just started Jericho in his absence. If you don't want to play precious. Okay. Who, by the way, has played better the last I, two games. I got to tell you, maybe, maybe this is the thing that Tibbs needed to see is precious to actually make an impact. And he has made an impact. These last two games, mm -hmm. but like someone has got to play four minutes center in that second half i don't care if it's og i don't care if it's i don't care if it's precious i don't care if it's jericho like just like 24 minutes for isaiah hartenstein when he is a a big man who look i know everybody says my body's ready for it i can do it i'm tough i can stay out there i can handle the minutes some people can't and some people even more importantly you don't want to find out if they can or can't you just don't want to deal. He had Achilles soreness for like most of last year. And it was the leading reason why he struggled so much to begin yes. his first season with the Knicks. Yes. He was playing through 
an Achilles injury the whole damn time. And he didn't really tell anybody for most of the time. Now he's got an Achilles injury again. He's been one of their most important players. He's been massive stepping up in the absence of Mitchell Robinson. And even if Mitchell Robinson comes back and is the exact same player, he's still going to be massive. And even more realistically, if Mitch comes back and he's not the same player because he's had a lower extremity injury and hasn't been able to run and jump and is just not going to be in your typical midseason slash playoff shape that everybody else is going to be in, he's going to be tremendously important. It's just like, if you could always play your center all 24 minutes of a second half, you would do John, it. John, like John, John, I'm not talking to Tibbs, John. I'm talking to you. If you could always play your center 24 minutes. Yes. Like there would be only five players on a basketball team. We would not be talking about the next bench. We'd be like, why aren't they playing Jalen Brunson 48 minutes? This is fair. We'd not be talking about bench players to add. You wouldn't need it. You need someone to give you a rest. I know, John, you haven't slept in 72 years. I know. And I know it makes you cranky and you just, you take it out on everybody else. I know. But I do. sometimes guys need to take a rest just for like four or five minutes a half. So I, I'm curious to know if, if somebody says to Tibbs, like, bro, just like cool it with the whole second half stuff. Like, look at this Achilles. Like, you want to, you want to use him for the whole second half against Washington and then not have him for way longer than that? I Look, I made the argument via uh, in our text thread the other day, uh, somewhat colorfully, that uh, I, I thought it was it's it, it's a worthwhile gamble because like, you, you know, there is no dividing line. If you play someone X amount of minutes more than they're used to, then there will be an injury versus if you don't, there won't. And like, we also don't know would they have lost one extra game, two extra games, no extra games, whatever, all those things. Now that this has happened and it is an issue that is a very different conversation. And from here on forward, I would pray that there is a different level of usage of this player. Is that fair to say? Yeah. I mean, I also think that like, it's not just about the total minutes. It's about how you get to those total minutes. You know, like for example, when Mitch first got hurt, and Jericho Sims stepped into the starting lineup. Part of the reason why I didn't love Sims as a starter for those five games was because Sims would sub out, maybe to foul trouble. There were a couple of games where he came out at like the eight minute marker of the first quarter. And then Hartenstein would play the final 20 minutes of the second. Yeah. Now, I would much rather, if Hartenstein is going to play 20 minutes a half, I would much rather yeah. have him play the first 10 minutes of the first quarter sit the last two of the first and the first two of the second and come back in at the 10 because then he's at least getting a break. It's the same thing as if I said to you at, that I ran a marathon and you said, how long did you run it in? And I said, two years. And you were like, what? And I was like, yeah, you know, I, I ran, I ran, uh, you know, a fifth of a mile and then I went home and I hung out and I had some potato chips. Next day I ran a fifth of a mile and I just did it every day until I finally got there. You wouldn't be like, you didn't run a marathon. You didn't do crap. You didn't do anything. But if I ran it for over four hours, you'd be like, damn, you must be exhausted. So like having a rest spliced in there, it's also about the stretches too. And, and so playing him, if Hartenstein is going to play 38 minutes in a game, mm -hmm. what can be tough or 40 minutes in a game, what can be tough is 16 minutes in the first half, 24, 23 minutes in the second half. Uh, it's just no, it's more about evening up those sorts of runs too, so that he can at least get a breather in because it's, it's every minute is not created equally, yeah. you know, like, like your first five minutes on the floor, you feel better than your last five minutes on the floor. You're going to be, if you play 24 straight minutes, your last five minutes, you're going to be more exhausted. You're going to be more hunched over. You're going to be more prone to foul. You might be more prone to roll something over because you're more tired. You don't have your stability. You don't have your core strength the same way you do when you first step on the floor. Like those last five minutes are more exhausting than those first five minutes. And the more you play, the more exhausting you become. Like this is just how humanity works. And then you die and then everyone moves on. That's a, our, our whole lives is just I, progressively becoming I, more exhausted. I was wondering how you're going to land that plane. That was good. That was very good. And like Andrew has died during this uh, podcast. Um, okay. This was, this was very good. 
Uh, we, we went a little <laughs> over, but that's fine. <laughs> He's dead. He's not there. Uh, Fred, uh, please plug, promote, whatever you want to do before I get you out of here. Uh, you can read all my stuff over at The Athletic. Uh, you can listen to my can podcast. And, should. and you, you can and should listen to my podcast, Cats and Shoot, uh, only on Patreon, patreon.com slash cats and shoot. That's my last name, K A T Z and shoot. You can sign up there when one episode, you can sign up for a package where you get one episode a month or a package where you, or one episode a week or a package where you get two episodes a week. Come check that out. Try to have as many good guests as I possibly can to offset myself. And uh, it's doing very well. I'm very happy with it. So uh, come, come, come join, come listen and uh, listen to Nick's home school and subscribe to John's newsletter. Like Ben very kind, very kind of you to say. Um, I uh, I feel bad that we killed Andrew, but listen, it's part of the hazard. To, oh, he's back. Never mind. He's back. He's like Bruce Willis. <laughs> Bruce, he died. It's hard to kill him. Yeah, he dies hard. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Fred. You're the best. Go subscribe to Cats and Shoot and also The Athletic and read. You know what's funny? I was I was going for a Sixth Sense thing. And you went for a diehard thing. What would this? I mean, because he well, he's actually dead. Oh, so you're saying now he's ghost? Okay. Oops. Sorry. Spoiler, Spoiler alert for the people that didn't see that movie seen from 1999. Last years. <laughs> Listen, the way these kids today, also, they don't watch movies. Also, so. <laughs> also, spoiler spoiler alert to the people who haven't seen Die Hard in the last 35 years. That is true. You, John because, McClane is fine. <laughs> well. <laughs> Um. Yes, is he hard. is fine. I mean, there's two, there's three sequ- four sequels. I think, right? Spoiler. Yes, there are four. There are four. Yeah. So that's not spoilers. Six cents. I apologize, anyone. I ruined the six cents for. But like, what the fuck are you doing? Um, you had to be there for that. Um, should we tell people that the Blair Witch Project isn't real? Well, that we already did. Apparently, you know. You know what? You know what's? You know what's going to happen if. What? uh if if Isaiah keeps playing these full second halves, we're gonna have Die Hartenstein. Uh, that's why they pay you the big bucks, Fred. That's why they pay me the mildly sized journalism bucks. Go, you could find more uh, puns. <laughs> Is that a pun? Sure, let's go with pun. That's definitely a pun. It's definitely Die Har- Die Hartenstein. I think it works. You could find more puns like that. And of, if you could believe it, even higher quality in all of Fred's writing. <laughs> Actually, I don't really pun in my writing. I very, you, you, you I don't tweet, pun in my writing. I'll have I, some wordplay, but puns are puns are lowbrow comedy, and they don't work in writing. And they're reserved for Twitter, which is as lowbrow as it can get. Yeah, uh, and then like I'm with you, you know. There you go. Uh, thanks. <laughs> Appreciate that one. Thank you, Andrew, for producing an exceptional episode. You're welcome. Jonathan and Frederick. Uh, As Fred said, Cats and Shoot is really good. I've joined him for a couple of uh, mailbags. Yes. And Andrew just came Cats on, and on Shoot Thursday. Is, is really good. Andrew, yes. Andrew was so kind was, enough to come on Thursday, read me some mailbag questions. He was awesome. He yelled at me a little bit when I deserved it. It was great. <laughs> yes. So, as he said, please come. Yeah, it's it's almost like you guys have chemistry together. It's just wild. M- much like Bruce Brown would have instant chemistry with all the rest of the Knicks. Uh, thank you, everybody out there. By the way, Bruce Brown, 38% from the corners over his last By minute. the way, the second unit in 55 possessions, the 100th percentile in defense, the 0th percentile in offense. It's almost as if the defense is fine. It's a great stat. It's a good stat. <laughs> um, thank you, everybody, for listening to another episode of the Knicks Film School Podcast. We appreciate you so much. Uh, we hope you join us for a uh, uh, pregame pod coming out before the Denver game. Yes. Yes. Uh, great. Recording it today. I'm going to ask him all about Bruce Brown. His back to point guard. Uh, maybe I should do the interview so I could hype him up a little bit more. Uh, join me after the Denver game and then all sorts of fun games. Casual Fridays, the whole thing. And uh, we will talk to you soon. Peace out.